Hello, this is K.A. Stats, the writer for Fool and Scholar Productions. That's Izo. And this is Travis Vengroff, the sound designer and producer. All of our shows are supported by our listeners via Patreon. If you join our Patreon, you can get access to cool perks like bonus episodes, music, digital books, and all sorts of fun bloopers and stuff. So check it out at patreon.com slash foolandscholar. We're always happy to have you. A link is in the show notes. Thank you for listening to our shows and supporting indie podcasts. The following documents and recordings are the fourth installment in a compilation detailing the events of Graham Kelson's return to Svalbard, following the occurrences of Outpost Freestead and Base Camp Piedra. Mr. Kasner was accompanied by fellow specialist Jokana Vukovic, archaeology professor Dr. Josefa Guerrero, and oceanographer Dr. Amelia Murray. In the summer months, Arctic cyclones are the foremost type of hazardous weather present in areas across the northern Atlantic, northern Pacific, and North Seas, capable of developing tumultuous sea conditions, impacting sea ice, dropping heavy precipitation, and resulting in avalanches. These Arctic cyclones can severely impact the lives of local populations. During these storms, travel is not advised. The White Vault Following the previous compilation, I had agreed to visit my mother's family site. After our late conversation, my mother and I were driven to Stockholm Orlando International Airport, where we boarded a small company plane. It appeared my mother knew both the pilot and the lone attendant, and that this was not a plane owned exclusively by Velsinger and Handelsbelag, but perhaps regularly rented. In Svalbard, Mr. Kasner's team had found the survivors hiding in the Niala Sun weather station. After Dr. Duan, a survivor from the Canadian Arctic Zone Science Organization, was able to further translate sections of Dr. Liu's remaining notes, the team decided to leave the weather station and start for Outpost Freestad. The following recording comes from the body camera of Mr. Kasner before the team left the weather station. her, right? Yes. Any updates? Not a thing. We need to go. We will leave Dr. Murray here with the survivors and head for the snowmobiles at the repair depot. I agree, but we need to talk about Yosefa. She spent a lot of time in that cave. From what I remember, you spent a lot more time... In a very different set of caves. She was there with the lights and the glyphs. We don't know how that affects someone. She seems to know a lot more than before. Any ideas? Not a one. But everything I've heard aligns with what we know. And I don't think she's wrong. Is the gear ready? Of course. We didn't unpack anything. Tell Yusefa, and then we'll look for the creature. If we don't see anything, we can start off toward the snowmobiles. You have a satellite phone, and you're not calling for help. We're trying to help you. Latest reports say rescue missions are still delayed due to the weather. Once the storm lets up, they'll be here. There are people in Longyearbyen just waiting for a break in the winds. So just sit here and wait. We've been trying to make contact for days. Lori is in there right now, trying to get someone to hear us. Give me the satellite phone. No. And I'm telling you, even if you reach someone, there is nothing they can do until this is over. Now, Dragona, are you and the Professor ready? Wait, you're leaving already? We're ready. How long will it take to reach the site? Wait! That thing is still out there! (sighs) Thank you for your concern, but we have to go. You'll have to go back out the roof hatch. We barricaded the front doors. That's fine. It's good you took the precaution. Where are you going? Do you have a location? If you don't come back after the weather clears up, we need to know where to send the rescue teams. If the weather clears up and the creature is gone and we have yet to return, then you should not worry about us anymore. What does that mean? Don't worry about us. Just focus on getting yourselves out of this. 
Worry about staying safe. Keep everyone here calm and stay inside. When we get back, I can fly us out of here, like I said. Hopefully, though, you'll all be safe and sound in Long Yerbian by then. How are we supposed to stay safe? It's out there. You've got three firearms around this room, which, from the looks of it, aren't even loaded. I've never shot one of them with a rifle, but the shotgun tends to work as a deterrent. Granted, the best option is to stay quiet, stay away from the windows, and don't draw attention to yourselves. You shot one of them? A while ago. It didn't stop it, but it also didn't like it. So, best option still is to just stay down. When you came in, on the helicopter, did you see another one? While flying in? No. Did you see another helicopter? Uh, Parked. No, but we couldn't see much of anything. Why? We saw something one night. The creature, we think. But the sound is what made me look. These horrible, screeching sounds. But what I saw was this big piece of metal dragged through the street. And it looked like a helicopter blade to me. Well, that's concerning. But I haven't seen another helicopter. Maybe we should have. Let's go. Seal the hatch again behind us. Dong Dong! Wait! If you come back, how will we know? What, what do you mean? What if what we see come back is not you? Lisa's right to worry. We have no way of knowing if anyone we see is real. We need to leave. We can't keep loitering here. There is work to do. One moment. Okay. So, we'll knock, like Dr. Duan. Hmm. Rephrase. That we would know. Fine. <laughs> we'll say... The Russian Pooh Bear is very sad. <laughs> what? The Russian Pooh Bear is very sad. It is. I've seen it. Now, Dr. Duan? Carter. Carter, please come with us to the hatch. We're leaving. <clears throat> Good luck. You'll need more than luck. But I hope you don't die. Thank you. So you knew these things were here before you arrived? Yes. It was a possibility. Whatever is out there is more important than getting us out of here? Yes. That makes you look like such an asshole? I always look like this. I have resting asshole face. He really does. It's a serious, untreatable condition. But we have others to save, Carter. This isn't contained to the weather station or Neolicent. Just don't die before you can fly us out of here. No promises. We still don't know where you're going. We know. Too much is waiting on us, but no one can follow. Not yet. First, I have to see it again. What? I don't understand. No more. <clears throat> Let's go. I'll go up first, then you. Dragana, follow up behind. Lock the hatch behind us and stay inside. Stay safe. Be sure to come back. It's locked. Then let's go. He said the best chance was the maintenance building down that way. They have survived this long. If they're lucky, they will get to go home. Like her. Let's not hang around. It helps no one. Stay with me and stay quiet. Come on. Don't leave the group under any circumstances. We can't see far enough to know who's really coming back.
you want to see me again? Shit! Stay with me and run! We can help you, Castor. Remember, they're cold. So cold. I don't understand. These are the people from those tapes. You make it difficult. Get Take in! too long. We have to hurry. I'll block this door. Grim, check the snowmobiles. Yosefa, check the other doors. Make sure they're locked. See? Yes. They're not trying to get in. Where did they go? We headed for snowmobiles. Not the place. They may be where we intend to go. They must go. These two, Dragala, drive that one with the dock and get that shit out of the way. You ready? Ready. Ready. Very little can be heard over the snowmobiles at this point. When Mr. Kasner, Ms. Bukovic and Dr. Guerrero entered the repair building, it was in a state of clear disarray. A large metal shelf from one of the walls had been knocked over atop one of the snowmobiles, and the items had scattered across the floor. While Dr. Guerrero was looking for other doors to secure, she went around this collapse. While I do not know if she noticed at the time, it became clear after examining the body camera video that a corpse was stuck under the shelving. There was no way to discern anything about the corpse, as the only parts visible were covered by either gloves or a light unisex teal and grey outer layer. While both other team members passed by the area, the corpse was not in view of their recordings. After Mr. Kasner identified two working snowmobiles, he opened the garage door and the team quickly departed Nialason. Given his past experience with Svalbard on Outpost Freestead specifically, Mr. Kasner led them out to a side road and then on to a snowfield heading southeast. They did not stop to discuss what they saw after leaving Nialason. They drove relatively near to each other due to the thick fog, but after several minutes of difficult navigation, the fog began to lift. The lifting fog revealed they were being watched. On both sides of them, they passed statue after statue, each facing inward toward them. The further they went, the more apparent it became that the statues were in two widely set rows, one on either side, which continued to narrow in around them with statues set at punctuated intervals. Eventually, they seemed to flank the two snowmobiles like streetlights on a motorway, until the fog cleared, the mountains opened up before them, and the statues were left behind. The following recording comes from the body camera given to Dr. Amelia Murray by Miss Vukovic. Is that right? I'm not sure, but it's on. Why wear it at all? I want to document this regardless, and the hands-free camera will make it a lot easier. Now, Carter, they left quickly, but I'm interested to know what else the pages you translated said. Are you okay? Tired. Very. I still have the papers. And the section I already got through. The professor, Dr. Guerrero, she had several sets of duplicates. She was strange, right? These are extreme circumstances. Strange behavior is not unnatural given what we've experienced. You're not wrong, Nadine, but Carter's... He's right. Remember how you were discussing the others in town? How some of the survivors started acting strangely and chanting? When we encountered them, Josefa knew the chant, and she was sure they were there to help. I feel like she knows a lot more than we do. Knowing too much can be worse. What about the pages you said she left? From Dr. Liu? It looks the same. 
Dr. Liu's writing became more and more erratic and prone to mistakes as she continued. But what I read doesn't seem to apply to us. Not here. Is that where they're going? Somewhere with this stuff in it? The light and the glyphs? I don't know. Hey, Carter, that is... Oh, holy hell! There's another survivor! Shit! I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see you. Hi, I'm Laurie. Dr. Amelia Murray. Nice to see another face. Do you want to switch out? Oh, no. There's something coming in over the radio. You need to come hear this. This way. Okay. Nadine, stay out here with Lisa and Paul, please. Keep an eye out. Of course. So, this started coming in over a few of the channels. Warning, it's strange. A lot of strange in here. And out there. Here. That's... that. It repeats. And it's the only thing I've heard all day. Still no word from the long Oh, What was that screaming? I really hope it was an animal. That's a bit too optimistic, Carter. That didn't sound like what the others were chanting. You heard something like this? No, she means the other survivors. The ones who didn't stop saying that phrase, even when the others were... Oh yeah, them. No, this, this didn't sound like them. And you've heard nothing else? Nothing? Are you still good for a few more hours on the radio? I want to get some sleep. Yeah, I'm fine for now. And you look like death. No, nope, not like death, sorry. That was in bad taste. Uh, you look very tired. Go sleep. Thank you. Excuse me, Amelia. I know I just discovered your existence, but... Would it be too much to ask for a cup of coffee? Carter looks worse, but I'm still tired. Not a problem. I could go for a cup myself. I'll make us some. Just tell me if you hear anything else. Thank you. Dr. Murray's recording continued for some time until she turned off the body camera to sleep. The survivor working the radio was later identified as Laurie Warner a satellite technician from the European Space Tracking Network. By this time, Mr. Kasner, Ms. Vukovic and Dr. Guerrero had driven about 12 kilometres to the easternmost part of the small bay on which Nyala Sun is positioned. They continued for another hour, turning north and heading further inland towards the outpost. The fog faded the further they drove from the village. The skies were a clear blue, and the wide vista of Svalbard's Arctic landscape was visible. The following recording comes from Miss Vukovic's body camera after they stopped at the bottom of a mountain rise. <sighs> it feels like a different world. The statues are gone. No fog. And yet they're nowhere to be seen. How are you holding up back there? Just fine, thank you. The rocks are far more uncomfortable than the ice and snow. Yes, well, it's a snowmobile. Rocks are not the preferred terrain. The sky is so blue. A real Arctic summer. The world opened up for us. So long as we go the right way. And we are. Why did we stop? To... take a breath. It's a moment of paradise. Going for a walk? Give me a few minutes. I'll be back. How long have you known each other? Since the 90s. 96, when we were young and stupid and upset with life and so completely oblivious to how great it was. I know the feeling, my friend. (sighs) And you, you're married, right? Yes, 
And the 90s were a happier time for us, too. Sorry, we don't have to talk about it. What did you feel about Dr. Murray? Something wrong. Something about her. How unmoved. <laughs> How readily she accepted the existence of these creatures. In dealing with the dead, have a fully prepared helicopter at the ready. Not the behavior I expect of a tenured, respectable oceanographer. She knew something was wrong and still wanted to go. If she had not injured her hand, she would have tried to come with us. I would not have thought she'd go that far. The studies didn't want her. What? I explain. Like you, but different. You don't really want to know. She knows, but they don't want her. Who do they want? Gosner, certainly. And me now. They think I know too much, and I still feel as though I have so much more to uncover. Do you have dreams about Patagonia? Nightmares? Sometimes. More often, I have nightmares about falling off cliffs. I have nightmares of that place, even while awake. He has them too. I know. Well, I figured it out. What kind of things do you see? In town, there was this pretty young woman, rather small, dark hair, standing beneath the waves. We saw her. I can hear her when I'm close enough, and I have to keep myself from walking into the water to hear her better. But I don't think Kostner hears her, because he doesn't want to. But I do. She has so many of the answers and what she says. Dragana, it makes so much sense. Do I want to know? The statues would want you if you did. <sighs> Ms. Vukovic and Dr. Guerrero remained in silence for some time while waiting on Mr. Kastner to return from his walk to a distant embankment. He had left his body camera on his snowmobile and was gone for about 20 minutes. Upon returning, they were largely silent before continuing on toward Outpost Freestead. Behind them, during a brief moment when Dr. Guerrero turned around while on the snowmobile, the fog down across the bay was visible and still impossibly dense. This concludes the fourth set of documents and recordings from the team's return to Svalbard and completes this section of information regarding their escape from Nialesund. At this time, my flight across Sweden had come to its end. The plane landed at a private airstrip in Lapland near the northern edge of Abisko National Park near Lake Tornatrask. The mountains we flew over still had snow caps dotted across the otherwise green summer landscape. When my mother and I disembarked the plane, we promptly entered into another car, a clean silver SUV, where we drove to the nearby town of Abisko. After waiting just over an hour in a small cafe, my mother received a text, and we left the cafe to find a dirty but well-maintained black SUV parked outside. My mother greeted the driver with a polite familiarity, and we began to drive south into the wilderness. We appeared to be driving along a dirt path that often lacked any visual markers, but the driver, a Swedish man by the name of Vidar, seemed to know exactly how to navigate the terrain. When asked, my mother informed me we had driven approximately 60 kilometers, but that we were still in Sweden. We were in a valley between two sections of a mountain range, the higher elevation still topped with white. The area was cast in the mountain's shadow, and the closer we were to our final destination, the more the rock formations, still natural in appearance, began to look well-ordered. Where we eventually parked, the ground seemed well-worn, and in the distance another man stood along a path up the mountain side. This recording comes from my personal recording device starting at the time we left the SUV. My mother was fully aware I was recording our meetings and discussions in full, and she made no attempt to stop me.
Where are we? The Velsingma Preserve, a privately owned and operated natural preserve here in Lapland. Officially, generations ago, this was an old logging forest. We had secured rights to harvest. But our intention was never to harvest. Now it makes more sense as a preserve. No gates or fences, as this is Sweden. But we keep most people out regardless. And this is where your site is? Our site, dear. Yes, this is where our site rests. Come. He's coming with us? Did that? Yes, he works here. The guard down there will stay in the valley. When was this site last active? In the winter of 2001, we had an active cycle, lasting approximately 76 hours. It was our most promptly addressed and deactivated cycle in the site's documented history. And who had to die to deactivate it? <sighs> I can tell you, but either way, you would not like to know. It was still deaths, and it is never a process we enjoy. Then why? You seem fully capable to control yourself. You do not appear to thirst for power. And if anything, you seem quite upset. I've had to do a lot of things I never wanted to do. Giving up you. Leaving your father. But why? It is required. There is a need. And the results are conclusive. If we do not do it, another from the family can take our place, but what then? It will happen regardless of who helps, but if it is us, we can be protected. The artifacts? And more. We are protected physically, but not emotionally. It does not come with the mercy of hardening of our souls. We suffer through what we must do. How do you feel about coming here? Feel? In what way? Before Essie's death, when you were on the plane flying up here, how did you feel? Or perhaps, uh, when you were approaching this place, what do you think about? I have not thought about that in many years. The first time my mother brought me here after I knew the reality of our situation, my hands were shaking, and I felt overwhelmed. I knew about this place, and about what we did. But I also knew she was setting me up for a choice I didn't want to make. Choosing who to send to the site? To the Guardians? No. Having to find a way to leave your father. Oh. Now, though coming here. How do you feel? I come here often. And please remember that the times when the site is active are very seldom. Normally I come to study and learn. In the winters the sun won't rise for weeks and the sky is filled with beautiful lights. This place is unquestionably beautiful and for that reason I feel a sense of peace here. I am in no danger. Our family has come here for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. I used to camp down at the bottom of the path during the summers. We buried my first dog, Atlas, down near those boulders. In many ways, this is my, our, home. And sometimes, bad things happen at home. So this is our site. The Svalbard site is Seizure Groups, and the Pasconian site is Sina Bene Securities. Why would it not be beneficial to give it up, and let Seizure deal with this site too? Each family has the responsibility to their own site. If one family extends their reach too far, it can weaken their resolve and commitment to their home site. And we worry. We will worry of others becoming too aggressive or too fanatical. We don't know what would happen if one family had too much luck, too much power. 
We can't be too greedy. Has it ever happened? Which part? One family trying to take more than one site. Not in our documented history. There is a tale from one of the Asia sites, but even members of their local families cannot confirm it. Now, would you like to go in? Hold on to say that. Maybe in a pocket, but keep it near. And know that what you see will not hurt you. She asked me this just as we rounded the side of a large protruding boulder. A cave entrance came into view before me. The opening was low, perhaps only a metre and a half at its tallest point, with a high jut that backed into the mountain side. I turned to look at the path we had taken, and it seemed like the only entrance to the location that didn't require coming in from above. Running out of the cave entrance were several long, dark cords which wrapped around the side of the hill and out of sight. While my mother's employee, Bidar, had walked with us up the path, another man was positioned at the front of the cave. He wore clothing that would not look unlike those of a backpacker, but he stood a bit too attentively and looked too clean to have recently hiked across the Swedish wilderness. My mother greeted the man when we approached, and then she gestured me in. This concludes the fourth set of documents and recordings into my personal examinations of events and completes this section regarding my first introduction to my family site in the Swedish wilderness. The White Vault, 